All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I know we have people joining us from all over the world today, which is so very exciting. Thank you for joining us here from across the globe. My name is Paige Bellenbaum, and I'm the founding director of an organization called the Motherhood Center, which is a clinical treatment facility for new and expecting mothers experiencing perinatal mood anxiety disorders located here in New York City. And today you're all gonna be learning a lot about perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, otherwise known as PMADs, from all of the speakers that we have here today. Today's event, A Global Perspective on Maternal Mental Health, features a panel of amazing women from around the world that have dedicated their professional lives to improving maternal mental health outcomes and supporting new and expecting mothers and birthing parents experiencing perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. We will hear experts in the field discuss perinatal practices in their respective countries and how they attempt to address the number one complication associated with childbirth. Just a few housekeeping items before we get into today's event. This event will be recorded and it will be made available to all of you that have registered for the event. We'll be sending out an email hopefully by the end end of the week with a link to the recording. And we will also be including resources. So any resources that come up in today's conversation will be included in that detail. We're also gonna allow a few minutes at the end for Q&A. So if you have questions throughout, please feel free to put them in the question and answer box and we'll get to as many as we can the last few minutes of today's event. So without further ado, we are going to move on to our esteemed panelists for the day. Uh, we're going to start with Dr. Prabha Chandra, who is Dean of Behavioral Science and Senior Professor of Psychiatry, as well as past head of the Department at the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences in Bangalore, India. She is the president of the International Association for Women's Mental Health and a co-author of the World Psychiatric Association Curriculum on Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence. Among her many awards, is the Marseille Medal in 2022 for Excellence in Perinatal Mental Health, awarded by the Marseille Society. Dr. Chandra started the first dedicated comprehensive perinatal psychiatry service in Asia for mothers with mental health problems. The Perinatal Outpatient Mental Health Clinic at the National Institute of Bangalore has helped nearly 4,000 women with mental illness during pregnancy and the postpartum period. The Mother Baby Inpatient Unit, which we're very excited to hear more about today, is the only one of its kind in South Asia and was started in 2009 and has supported, supported nearly 1,000 mothers. I would also like to welcome Silvia Herrero Rodriguez. She's a postpartum support international country coordinator for both Costa Rica and Ecuador. She is a mother and a brave PMAD survivor. Silvia started promoting PMAD peer support groups in both countries in 2021. She has a BA in psychology and is finishing her studies to acquire her licensure as a clinical psychologist at the University of Costa Rica. She's currently researching the cultural elements present in the transformation process women go through as they become mothers in Costa Rica. Dr. Lavinia Lumu completed a fellowship in psychiatry from the Colleges of Medicine in South Africa and a Master's of Medicine in Psychiatry with Waterstrom. She has her own private practice with a special interest in perinatal psychiatry. Dr. Luma is, Lumu is currently running a pro bono maternal mental health clinic at the Rahima Musa Mother and Child Hospital. She is president elect of the International Marseille Society for Perinatal Mental Health, as well as an honorary lecturer at the University of the Witwatersrand Department of Psychiatry, Faculty of Health Science. And last but not least, representing the US, Adrian Griffin, MPP, is the Executive Director of the Maternal Mental Health Leadership Alliance, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to national advocacy for the mental health of childbearing people in the US. Adrian serves on the Board of Directors of the Marseille Society of North America and the Mental Health Liaison Group. She also founded Postpartum Support Virginia. Adrian graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy and has a master's in public policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Such a warm welcome to all of you. It is such an honor to be in your presence. 
And we are just really excited to hear about perinatal mental health practices around the world. To get us kicked off today, what I wanted to do is just do kind of a, a fun exercise in looking at some best practices uh, from some of the countries that are not represented here today to just kind of plant the seeds around what other countries are doing in regards to maternal health and mental health practices. So in Finland, there's a maternity package, which is now world famous. Once mothers are 154 days or 22 weeks pregnant, they can apply for a free box through the Finnish social security system. The box is filled with 63 essentials for baby and the colorful box can be doubled as a bed. In China, new mothers have a month of confinement named Zoyotsu or in Mandarin, sitting the month, where they build up their strength and bond with their baby after childbirth by staying home. In Guatemala, a new mom rests for 40 days during a time called La Quarantena, while people in the community do household chores for her and bring hot, healthy soup to eat. Japanese mothers move back home for Satogari Unben. Satogari means returning to the original family, town, or house, and Bunben means delivery. In Belgium, new mothers have a Kram Vermusorgster, a maternity nurse who comes to the home to provide a minimum of 24 hours of care with the first eight days after a mom is discharged from the hospital. Oops, and then finally wanted to end on this slide to just give people a snapshot in regards to maternity leave practices, how countries rank. We can see here at the top that Bulgaria takes the lead in providing 58.6 weeks of maternity leave for women after they give birth. Uh, and so with that, just some broad strokes and some highlights of how other countries manage uh, supporting new and expecting mothers across the globe. I'm now gonna turn over to our esteemed presenters and I'm gonna ask one question to all of you. If you can each tell us a little bit about what it's like to be pregnant, give birth, and the postpartum period, what it looks like in each of your respective countries. So in no particular order, whoever would like to kick us off, take it away. You want me to start? Why don't you go ahead, Dr. Chandra? Um, thank you. Thank you for having me here. So it's such a delight to be amidst all of you. So in India, um, I think one of the things that we must remember is most pregnancies are unplanned. Um, women don't have control over contraception. Majority of women don't have control over contraception. So um, Pregnancies happen quite early on uh, after marriage. Most um, women who become pregnant are married in a marital relationship because, um, you know, having partners or, or a live-in kind of a, a situation is very unusual. Um, and so what happens is that the woman uh, gets married and within a year, her family starts asking when she's going to tell them the good news. And... Um, and whether she likes it or not, she becomes pregnant because contraception is not in her control. Um, and that's true for majority of the women. So as you can imagine, a lot of women are young. They are unprepared for pregnancy. Majority of the pregnancies are unplanned. Uh, and as a result, it's quite a challenging situation for many women. Um, having said that, once they become pregnant, most women say that they're pretty happy because I think it adds to their um, social status to be a mother in, in a community like ours, which is very collectivistic. Uh, and um, when, when she's about seven months pregnant, she usually moves to her mom's place, um, and especially for the first child, and the delivery happens in the mother's home. Um, it's the responsibility of the maternal family to look after the expenses of the delivery, to look after the nutrition of the mother, um, and to sort of handle the whole process. After the baby is born, uh, she has a lot of support from her maternal family, uh, usually the grandmother, and she stays with the maternal family at least till the baby is 
four or five or six months old, sometimes even as long as one year, and then comes back to the husband's home. So that's a sort of general pattern of being pregnant. So while there are huge challenges uh, of the fact that she's invariably not emotionally prepared or even physically prepared to have a baby, rates of anemia are very high, um, nutrition is poor, but she has a lot of family support. So I think it's like a combination of things. Um, of course, there's a huge pressure on the mom to have a, a male child. Um, in India, that's it's really a big problem, particularly not so much for the first baby, but for the second or the third baby, uh, if she's had only girl children. And that adds to another layer of complexity and emotional stress on the mother. So just, just a brief idea about what it's like to be a pregnant and giving birth in India. Thank you for that, Sandra. Dr. Lumo, how about you? Um, yeah, thank you so much um, for inviting me. And I, I think this is a valuable platform. So I'm from South Africa. And um, in South Africa, um, we are quite urbanized in terms of a lot of influences um, from Western cultures. And people move to where there are resources. So the rural areas are unlimited. And most people move to the urban areas. Um, we also have a, a similar challenge in that um, there's a lot of unplanned and unwanted pregnancies. This is despite um, the efforts that the government has put in place, including free contraception, free condoms, and also access to legal um, uh, uh, termination of pregnancy clinics. Um, a lot of this is because um, the nurses' attitudes to young people when they access family planning, it's a bit negative in the community. If you're this young girl and the nursing sister knows you, you'll be chastised. So there's a sort of an avoidance of accessing services. We also have a huge problem in that um, a lot of, there's a lot of um, children born out of wedlock. Um, Recent research is saying up to two thirds um, of South African children only have one parent. So lots of people fall pregnant out of wedlock. And so in a city like Johannesburg, where I'm from, um, a person has left their rural home. There's no support. They've come to Johannesburg. They think there's going to be money and wealth and opportunity. There's none of that. They're living in an informal settlement, in a settlement and boom, they fall pregnant. Um, fortunately, the government has made strides. We do have access to um, what they call um, midwife obstetric units. So if you're a low risk, um, you go to the midwife obstetric clinic. If you're high risk, you get referred. Um, what is What we are challenged with specifically in Johannesburg, because we are near um, the border to um, other, other African countries, we do have a huge um, immigration problem. Um, especially of undocumented um, immigrants and who enter the country to access our health services because with our laws, there is access to free um, health care. And unfortunately, you know, it's, it's difficult for them. So um, the thing that really concerns me is after a mother delivers, um, you know, if it's a normal delivery, you stay in hospital for six hours. And then if you're stable, you're sent home and you don't have the support. So if, if a mother gave birth in a rural area, um, there'd be support from um, family, from aunties, from um, you know, extended family in the city, that's not the, the case. So um, it, it is a challenge. And, and I think that's why um, there is a, a huge influx or increase in maternal mental health um, problems. Yeah. Thank you for that, Dr. Luma. And before we move on to other speakers, you know, one thing I, I speak to mothers a lot about that we treat here at the Motherhood Center um, is, you know, all mothers, I, many mothers approach motherhood and giving birth and the transition to motherhood. I think with this expectation that it's going to be something that's natural, right? It's what we do as women, as birthing parents. We've been doing it since the dawning of time. It's something we'll just know instinctually. Um, and what I find over and over again and, and make every effort to remind new and expecting mothers is that giving birth and becoming a mother 
is something for those of us who are doing it for the first time. We've never done it before. We don't know what we're doing. There is no such thing. Um, and I stand behind this and there's been research to suggest it as a maternal instinct, right? And it's pure scientific form. We are not genetically uh, designed to know exactly what to do, uh, which makes it all that much harder, right? In the ways that you're describing all of the processes that women go through in your countries to become mothers is that there's just this expectation that they will know. Um, and we don't uh, look at the postpartum period, how countries can do or don't support brand new mothers. It, it's such an, it's such an area, it's such a rich area. Anyway, I just have to throw that in. Um, Sylvia, how about you? Um, yes, uh, well, first of all, thank you very much um, for having me here. Um, I'm very honored actually to be here speaking with um, such prestigious professionals. And um, I, I, before I start actually sharing from the countries that I, I work with, I would like to first say that there are many cultural realities within our countries. Um, so there are different traditions within the countries uh, regarding pre pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum. So uh, even in countries as small as Costa Rica, for example, with only 5.1 million inhabitants, uh, there are different realities and practices, right? And even more so Ecuador, for example. So I don't know how much you know, there are only 17.8 million inhabitants, but we're talking about a plurinational state with 14 indigenous um, nationalities, um, which work like with their own traditions, their own insti institutions, they have their own uh, justice system. And for example, they have their traditional midwives who tend to their um, birthing process. So um, this, I, I wanted to state this because I would not like for you to take my words as absolute for everything that happens in these countries. Uh, I would like to refer most to the realities that I am familiar with. So in, in Costa Rica, um, in the community that I am studying, it's called Alajuelita. It's actually, um, it's an urban community with uh, low and middle, middle income families. And I was, um, I, I find it familiar that um, there are also many pregnancies that are not wanted. But these happen in pregnancy, I'm sorry, in adolescence, and they are not planned, and they mo many adolescents do not want them. Others do. Some, some actually uh, seek to get pregnant. My some really do not. And um, these happen outside marriage. Fathers are sometimes in the picture, sometimes they are not, and it's not uh, that all, all that relevant uh, often. And uh, well, we do have the public health system. Uh, we have what is called EBAIS, which are like a primary, uh, primary care right system. Uh, they are community clinics. In most communities in Costa Rica, we have them. You have a general physician there who um, does like the control month to month of the pregnancy. And... Um, if there is any complication, it will be referred to a hospital to be attended. And most births in Costa Rica do take place in hospitals. That's around 94% of births, right? Um, we do have a high level, uh, I'm sorry, not that high level of C-sections. Uh, it's around 18% of C-sections in public hospitals. Um, I wasn't able to find the number for private hospitals, but um, I would assume from what I know, people I know, that it's mostly C-sections in private hospitals. And um, well, basically, like culturally speaking, um, motherhood is much accepted once, like once uh, these girls, whether they want it or not, are pregnant, they have to accept their, their motherhood, right? And um, mostly their families accept it too. Um, and they are one of the main supports of uh, new mothers, right? 
um, the state, uh, besides this um, health support, right, in the health system, there's not much more support from the state. What we have is the support from the families. We also speak of la cuarentena that you showed there in Guatemala. Um, but there are not uh, like such a specific um, protocols. <laughs> Each family kind of uh, adjusts. And um, from what I've seen, it's not that much about taking care of the mother, but helping her take care of the baby, right? Uh, and it happens like it could be their own mother or their father or an aunt or a brother, like not everybody, but somebody. <laughs> and when there's no one, it's a really lonely uh, postpartum period because if there's no one in the family, like there's no resource to go to, right? Um, so uh, I, I, one element that um, I think is important here to mention, it's um, obstetric violence because uh, there was a recent study in Costa Rica in 2021, it was published on um, women, it was a survey actually, on uh, women who became mother, I think in between 2016 and 2018 in Costa Rica. And around 57%, 50, yes, 57.7% 57 of women who gave birth between those years reported having experienced at least one type of obstetric violence during childbirth. And if you broaden the definition of uh, obstetric violence so that you take from childbirth to when they leave the hospital, 100% of women have suffered at least one type of obstetric violence. So that's kind of like your, your welcome to motherhood, right, um, in Costa Rica. I, I thought that was kind of shocking. I actually didn't know, but from the stories of the mothers uh, in my research project, it's actually an exploratory qualitative research within the community, but all stories kind of had elements of obstetric violence. So when I found this, it was uh, like very enlightening because it explains, right, uh, how all these women um, were welcome to motherhood, basically. So um, I think that's one perspective there. Mm -hmm. The trauma that goes along that with that, Sylvia, of that obstetric violence for that, for that new mother. Mm, yes. And well, in Ecuador, I wasn't able to find so many um, data in general, but from the experiences of the support groups, we also find much of obstetric, obstetric violence, many C-sections, uh, the rates are even higher. Here in average, 48% of all births in hospitals are C-sections. So it's much, much higher. And um, in general, family also has this role, uh, not exactly the same, uh, but in the support groups, one can see that there, there's a role to play supporting new mothers. So, mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So, yeah. Adrian, how are we? How are we doing this in the U.S.? Well, let's just say that the United States has uh, one of the highest maternal mortality rates among industrialized nations. And in fact, our maternal mortality rate is increasing while most other countries see a decrease. And this is kind of shocking when you think that, you know, the United States is the richest country in the world, right? And we pay more per capita for healthcare than any other country. And so how we have this very highly medicalized system and yet so many moms are dying is really, is really quite troubling um, and has really bubbled up maternal health to be a national priority. In fact, the White House, the president's office, put out as a blueprint early this year on maternal health um, with the goal of making the United States the safest place on earth to have a baby. We have a very far way to go. But like I said, it's now a national priority. The White House, Congress, our elected officials are paying attention to maternal mortality. So as far as pregnancies go, like many of you uh, in, in your countries, um, about half of pregnancies in the United States are unintended, not necessarily unwanted, but um, not necessarily planned. Um, about 50% of pregnant mothers receive Medicaid insurance. So that means that they are lower income, un, 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 underinsured, um, sometimes uninsured until they become pregnant. 
Uh, about 40% of births are to single parents. Interestingly, again, because we are such a highly medicalized nation, about 98% of births occur in hospitals um, and about one third of those births are by C-section. So I was really surprised to hear Sylvia say that the C-section rate for the births in hospitals is close to 50%. So um, just interesting to hear that. Um, only about 8% of births in the United States are attended by a midwife. So again, very highly medicalized system, which in some way is good. I mean, for example, during pregnancy, a uh, pregnant person sees their healthcare provider uh, for an average of 15 visits um, before the baby is born. And then an average of at least eight well baby pediatric visits in the first year postpartum. And so uh, pregnant and postpartum mothers and childbearing people in the United States are, are often very involved with the healthcare system, which gives us an opportunity to talk to them about their mental health and, and discuss PMADs. Um, we're not doing it all the time, but, but we're, we're, those people are in the healthcare system, so we have the opportunity at least to educate them and screen them about these illnesses. Um, interestingly, the median age for um, a new mother for a first time mother in the United States has been on the rise and is somewhere now between age 27 and 30. So we definitely, you know, have a different sort of profile uh, here in the United States than in some of the other countries. So we're really so fascinated to hear what goes on in everybody's country. Oh, and then the last point, we have very little family support, right? Most young parents do not live near their families of origin. Uh, we have no paid family leave, as Paige already pointed out. We have none of those things that other countries have. There's no baby box. There's no quarantina. Uh, we have many women who return to work within two weeks of uh, following delivery. So uh, we have a far, far way to go. Thank you for that, Adrian. And I, I wanted to add, thank you for that alarming data uh, around maternal mortality in this country that the CDC has also enlightened us that mental health is the leading cause of maternal mortality in this country. PMADs and substance use are the leading cause. And this is why hopefully America on many levels of government are starting to pay a little bit more attention to this issue and this crisis. Um, and the subsequently alarming information is that three quarters of those deaths have been deemed preventable. There are things that we can be doing to save lives. So, you know, we're, we're, we are very alarmed by the tragedy behind these numbers, and we are hopeful that this information will start making a difference. Uh, and lastly, just around family support, which you, you articulated so well, Adrian. Becoming a mother, becoming a family in the U.S. is such a lonely and isolating experience, particularly in the app during and even after the pandemic. And I just wanted to highlight in speaking with Sylvia before uh, in just preparation for this event and bringing that up, she was, it was very interesting to hear from her that even in cultures where having extended family around to be helpful and support, that also comes with its own uh, kind of litany of, of strengths and weaknesses, and correct this if it's wrong, Sylvia, but having a mother, a mother-in-law around, you know, hands-on, kind of telling you how to do everything, what you're doing is right and wrong, perhaps coming from a, a very different perspective when it comes to maternal mental health, you know, even though we might uh, put some of these practices on a pedestal and without doubt can make a big difference, there's also another side to that. Um, yes, actually, definitely. And even um, directly related to maternal mental health, because uh, then come all the um, like all the prejudices that exist. For example, if you're a mother and your baby is healthy, you have no reason to be sad. You shouldn't be crying. You have to like you have to push through it. Just work through it. You'll be all right. You cry a little bit, then you'll be all right. You know, so it also um, like it also comes with all these musts. And within those musts, it's the denial of mater maternal mental health, right? So um, it's like a double-edged sword, you would say, because <laughs> on one hand it can help, but it also can not help, right? 
in in terms of maternal mental health. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's a really good segue into our next question. And I want to get into maternal mental health. I wonder if each of you can uh, please speak a little bit about what perinatal mood and anxiety disorder rates look like in your country. How prevalent are there? They, and I'm going to throw uh, a question into that as well. Can you speak a little bit to what screening for maternal mental health looks like in your country? Um, and Dr. Chandra, I see you are off, so go for it. Take it away. Um, yeah, so it's, um, so first of all, the rates of maternal PMAD are quite high. All There's been uh, several systematic reviews which have been done recently. And the rates are much higher in low and middle income countries compared to high income countries. Um, so around 15 to 20% are the rates which have been reported, 10% in pregnancy and 15 to 20% in uh, the postpartum period with the postpartum period being defined as at least a year postpartum and not sort of the strict six weeks postpartum. Um, so rates are very high. However, this, there are very poor screening programs. And I think part of it is related to the fact that till now, mental health was not a priority. You know, I was listening to Adrian talking about the maternal mortality rates in, um, in the US and uh, the rates in India are, for example, around 75 per 100,000 in the sort of low frequency areas, like low maternal mortality areas. And the higher ones, it's around 120 per 100,000. So rates of maternal mortality are really very high, among the highest in the world, actually. And so what happens is that the government till now has been focusing on reducing the maternal mortality rates, ensuring hospital deliveries, getting ambulances so that mums, you know, the last mile is covered and mums reach, um, you know, delivery units in time. So I think the, the emphasis has been on decreasing maternal mortality and infant mortality. It's also been on improving maternal nutrition. Um, so mental health has actually been completely in the back burner. However, things are changing and that's really good. Um, and that's because, especially the nutrition programs, what has happened is that the government has put, been putting a lot of money into you know, providing nutrition supplements, iron, folic acid, talking about nutrition to mums and families. And they have found that nutrition has not improved. So even though there's been a lot of pumping of money onto these programs, uh, mothers are not feeling any better. And then when they looked at what could be the factors which might be preventing mums from eating better, there are two things which have come up. One are gender related issues. So women eat last and least in families, even pregnant mothers. Uh, and the second is poor mental health. And so now the UNICEF with the Ministry of Health has actually started a big program in several states, uh, which has actually started looking at um, screening and trying to, to actually piggyback mental health onto the maternal nutrition programs, which is actually a good way of doing it so that the mental health program is not seen as a separate program or burdensome or extra money but it's actually part and parcel of the maternal health program. So that's something that has, uh, you know, been started around a year, year and a half ago during the pandemic. And I think that's, that's really good. But the challenge is that, you know, even this morning, I got a call from one of the government saying, we just want four questions or three questions or better still two questions. You know, so they want, they don't want the Edinburgh postnatal depression scale. It's very hard for women to understand it, yes. the nuances of it, to have a four point rating scale with each item having a completely different rating. You know, our women don't understand that. They don't get it. They're not used to answering questionnaires. They would rather be asked simple questions. So, um, and the government has, 50 other things they want to ask in the cards, the maternal you know, health card. So mental health is just sort of, we just have to squeeze it in. So we're trying to make more efficient questions. We are bor borrowing from the South African experience and validation of certain questions where we come up with two or three questions where we can you know, at, at least identify risk. 
So the things that we are doing now is looking at risk. How has, has the woman had a past history of anxiety, depression, or any other mental health problem or has sought counseling or medical treatment? First question, highlight risk. Second question, is there domestic violence and family conflict? Again, flag for risk. Third question, have you been feeling low, um, you know, sad mood, lack of interest? Yes or no? And the fourth question, have you been worrying excessively, been very tense or stressed out, looking at anxiety? Yes or no? So they only want yes or no questions. They don't want any rating, mild, moderate, severe, et cetera, because the, the health workers don't have that kind of time. But I think that itself is such a huge achievement yeah. that governments are asking mental health professionals Give us those questions. We want to put it in. And they've also asked us for a, a little write-up for mums in pictures about what they can do to improve their mental well-being. And they're going to add it into the mental health card, which all mums will take home. You know, and what fathers can do and what families can do. So to me, even those four questions and two pages are a real achievement. It's been years and years of advocacy, which has gotten us this far. But I don't know whether it's the advocacy which has helped or the realization that no maternal health, maternal health program will work unless you have mental health as part of it. So I think that's been the sort of gradual learning from the ground, uh, which has led to this. So that's how, so, so as you can imagine, screening was non-existent till a year ago, it has now started. Um, and we are getting base rates now of many of these conditions. So, um, so I, I'm really hopeful that more and more states, if they see things like this happening, uh, they're going to take up this good practice. Um, yeah, so that's that's the scene. That is so huge that that has been uh, something that has, has been able to happen and is underway. And I'm sure it has to do with both the advocacy and also perhaps the prevalence. And um, it, it's an enormous success. Uh, that you've been able to play a part in that. And I'm so happy, Dr. Chandra, that you mentioned partners and fathers. You know, one of the things that I always, always reiterate and iterate when I'm out there training providers or speaking to anyone who cares about this issue is that, you know, when you're a new or expecting mother that is struggling from a perinatal anxiety disorder, you are drowning in a sea um, and you are paddling as hard as you can to keep your head above water and breathe. You are not in a position to pick up the phone and start calling providers to see if they accept your insurance or even know what to do. A lot of the times you don't even recognize that something's wrong and how important it is for partners and other family members to be able to recognize the warning signs so they can be that life preserver uh, and pull that new or expecting mother on the shore. So to hear you say that that educating partners and family members is a part of this, I think it's wonderful because it's so necessary. Yeah, Adrian, go ahead. Uh, so I, I'd like to go next because Paige, what you were just saying about the mom who feels like she's drowning, he can't get above water, like that was me when I experienced this. My son is almost 20, he turns 20 next week. And I really, I was like, <gasps> I can't get above water and right to try to figure out the complex mental health system, which is a whole parallel universe here in the United States to our medical system when I was already anxious and depressed. And, you know, I had every possible resource at my hands, right? I'm educated. I have a husband. I have insurance. I speak English. I have the internet. It took me six months to try to get the help that I need. And so I often think about women who, number one, don't know that something's wrong, as you pointed out, Paige. If they're a first-time mom, they may just think this is how it feels to be a mom, right? Or can advocate for themselves or they're back at work already or they don't have insurance or all of these other things. It's amazing that any mom can actually get the help that she needs, which is so important why we need to do all of that education and screening. We cannot wait for them to say, hey, I need help because then it's too long. She needed help months ago by the time she acknowledges that she needs help. So um, unfortunately in the United States, we do not have consistent screening and education for pregnant and postpartum people. Uh, we have some states or health systems that have made requirements for patient screening at different points along that continuum, but mostly around, pregnant, uh, around delivery. Um, 
but it really is up to every single hospital, state, health system, individual providers in a practice to decide whether or not they're going to screen. So that's one reason that my organization has partnered with the March of Dimes. We've led a year long effort to bring together different screening recommendations from different organizations, really come up with what we're calling a framework for when to screen. And it needs to start as soon as somebody is pregnant, right there, as soon as they're, hey, we want you to know that mental health issues are one of the most common complications of pregnancy and childbirth. We care as much about your mental health. We're gonna screen you periodically, et cetera. And that conversation has to happen all throughout pregnancy and their first year postpartum. So we normalize it, we reduce the stigma, and we give the parent the opportunity to, to recognize, hey, I need some help before it's too late. Thank you for that, Adrian. And I, I just wanna add, um, and this will, this is a, a preview of our next question, but you know, when we talk about statistics here in the US, as you well know, the standard is either one in seven or one in five. Um, and what I always say uh, when I'm talking about this is that that's the statistic we have, but for those of us who do this work, we know it's more like one in three. And since the pandemic, there's been research to suggest as high as 50 to 70%. Um, but there's a lot of factors that go into the underrepresentation, and that's something that we'll talk about in the next question. Um, but jumping over to you, Dr. Momo, tell us a little bit about PMAD rights and screening practices in your country. So in South Africa, we have a huge challenge in that there's like very limited research. Um, yeah, so the research we do have is it's quite small. Um, level research, but it is sitting at around 30% um, at an antenatal or prenatal clinic. Postnatally, um, <laughs> the research is, is, is minimal, but you're looking at about um, one in four. Um, and the challenges we have, we have a huge problem in South Africa, especially in um, our African population, um, you know, um, majority of South Africa, 80, 85% of the population is a black or African and the cultural nuances of mental illness um, around the fact that, you know, people still hold strong stigmas, even health professionals, unfortunately, that having mental illness, even depression or anxiety, um, if you're a traditionalist and into traditional cultures that you um, have been bewitched. And um, so often what happens is um, in some cases, people rather consult what they'd call a traditional healer uh, to sort of, um, you know, do rituals to tr try and, you know, resolve this curse um, that this person has. And then on the other spectrum, um, there's a strong um, sort of religious component um, specifically uh, the Christian uh, faith, whereby, you know, if you're not a traditionalist, um, some, a lot of people, say, well, could say up to 60 to 70% of um, South Africa, South Africans are somehow um, Christian. So if it's not traditionalist uh, based, it's um, religion and being depressed means you're a sinner or you're demon possessed. So if a person's not visiting a traditional healer, which they'd call a sangoma, then they'd be visiting a, a prophet. And we have um, sort of a pandemic, if you would, of these um, prophetic or charismatic churches and people going there um, to try and get healed from their depression and anxiety. So I think that's a major barrier to access in the first place, but the health professionals are also playing a role. Um, and if we look at um, screening, um, yes, um, one of my colleagues, um, Simone Honigman, has done a lot of advocacy policy work to try and get screening because the Edinburgh scale in South Africa, I do it, it's, it's very tedious. I mean, we have 11 official languages and this is let alone um, all the immigrants that come in with their own la languages as well. I mean, we get people from as far as Pakistan, Bangladesh, Somalia in South Africa and you know, language is limited and it is very wordy and nuanced and how we speak, even if someone understands English, 
I find them, you know, it's difficult to standardize. So she did develop and, you know, standardize a, a, a tool. And it, I think the idea came from the woolly questions, three questions, and they're very direct questions. Um, it's And it's part of what they call the uh, maternal health record. And every pregnant woman walks around with that throughout their pregnancy. So it's in two weeks. In the last two weeks, um, have you been worrying too much so you know even the word depression so we'll say have you been worrying too much or thinking too much in the last two weeks in the last two weeks have you been feeling hopeless and sad third question is um have you thought about harming yourself or uh, suicide in the last two weeks it's very direct yes no yes no and if they answer no for the third question immediate um a referral and then there is a question to say, have you offered counseling? Yes or no? Um, so that um, midwives who would usually be the ones doing the screening would be able to offer it. But the challenge is, even if we offer the service, where does the mother go to? And we have a, we have a mental health pandemic, um, you know, um, but like referring to a referring a mother for mental health services, average waiting time for a psychologist is six months. Average waiting time to see a doctor who's comfortable, not even a psychiatrist, a, who's comfortable with treating mental illness, it's another six months. And and then what happens um, in between that? Um, we also have a huge pandemic, teenage pregnancies through the roof, and worse during the pandemic. And another pandemic, which is um, gender-based and intimate partner violence, it's, it's really getting out of hand. So these are the challenges um, that we are faced with in South Africa. Thank you for that, Dr. Lumo. And I, I hear this kind of, this, this theme running through, even with the standardized instruments that we have, that we do, some of us use globally or have used, um, case in point, the EPDS, you know, it was some, an instrument that was created in 1987. Um, the language that's used is very obsolete. It can be difficult to understand, especially how it translates. Uh, and it, it needs a makeover, right? Like based on all of our cultures and comfort levels, you know, using these more diagnostic clinical terms for a newer expecting mother to connect with while she is struggling, she very well needs be might be less likely to, um, but if we use her language, right? If we talk about what it's like to be in this place through the lens of, you know, through the cultural competency lens and all of these other things that are important, the chances of having, um, you know, more realistic responses could be much greater. Uh, but I'm 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 very interested to learn that it sounds like many of your countries are adapting the screening instrument or methodology to come up with something that works a little bit better. How about you, Sylvia? Um, well, as Dr. Chandra shared, actually, um, the PMADs in Costa Rica or Ecuador, we don't have specific statistics so we have to guess that they are part of that um, low income country rates where it's more or less twice as often than in high income countries um, so we don't have any screening process like um, our regular screening process uh, there is a psychologist in the hospitals right we, we do have that but in it's like they don't screen yeah, for um, PMADs among mothers, right? So um, we have like this specialized hospital uh, that attends to pregnant women and their um, the the birth and everything in Costa Rica, right? I'm sorry, and um, but the the psychologist does not um, like have a questionnaire or a specific system to to speak to all patients so when someone says like i feel depressed but that the person needs to say that <laughs> then maybe they will be referred to the psychologist and maybe they will have some more um uh, 
sessions, right? But if during postpartum, for example, a woman feels down and says, no, I'm going to go to the um, community health center to see what they can do for me, you'll have a, a general doctor there. And sometimes you'll get antidepressive. Uh, sometimes you can have referral to psychology, but it's the same story. It's, it'll be three or four months until you're able to get an, um, an appointment, right? And sometimes to a psychiatrist. And then that leads us to another issue. Uh, well, we, we have very little specialized professionals in perinatal mental health. So um, specifically with psychiatrists, that's an issue because uh, they will hesitate to uh, medicate mothers, lactating mothers, or they'll ask the mother to win, to be able to take the medications, right? So um, this is not, uh, like many mothers won't take the medications because they don't want to win or they'll be stuck in that situation, right? So um, I think that, that um, I, I think the experience that Dr. Lumo and Dr. Chandra were sharing is a very important experience for our countries. Um, in Costa Rica specifically, I think that there are many possibilities to be able to screen and to educate mothers on PMADS because uh, for the nine months that the woman is pregnant, once a month she goes to the doctor. She also has access in this advice. Many of them have a prenatal uh, class that they take for several sessions and it educates some basic things like uh, pregnancy, uh, childbirth, and basic care of a newborn, right? You could include, uh, look, uh, now you're going to this transition, right? And <laughs> there's this thing called PMAD, so uh, if you need anything, we're here, right? Uh, that could happen, just not, doesn't happen, you know? And um, after that, the whole first year of the child, um, the mother has to take it every month to see the to control the health of the child. And it could be another opportunity to educate, to screen, right? And um, it just isn't done. I think um, that one of the issues is that we have no data on this. So uh, on what uh, the incidence is in Costa Rica. So maybe the policymakers think that, no, it, maybe it's not that much or it's not a big issue, right? I think it's maybe invisibilized. Um, so I think, uh, well, we have been, uh, there are several uh, professionals like myself, I think many of them have gone through PMADS and are survivors and have uh, begun specializing in the area. And we, we even have psychiatrists in Costa Rica. In Ecuador, I haven't been able to find a specialized psychiatrist for you to get an idea. Uh, but it's just like individuals, you know, but from their personal experience are starting to work. But so we're just getting started, basically. <laughs> and that's what I was uh, going to get um, to. I think that's um, that's about it. And I, I think it's very interesting, uh, this possibility to, to reduce to a few questions, because that is definitely viable. I think it's definitely a way we can work with, right? Adrian, I see you want to say something. Go ahead. You know, as I'm listening to my esteemed panelists, I'm scratching my head and I'm thinking, why don't we just prevent these illnesses? We know how to talk about it. We know that there are skills and tips and techniques that we can give new moms to help transition to motherhood, right? We know basic, simple things like getting enough sleep, right? And, and getting a little exercise and eating properly all these things together, getting some social support, like not everybody needs to see a therapist or a psychiatrist. If we could start earlier, why don't we just expect that everybody is gonna have this tough transition and give all moms these coping techniques and social support groups. That would be so much easier than having to worry about is the screening tool appropriate, you know, this long wait list, like let's get ahead of this and help prevent these illnesses from happening. So that's what I just keep is, you know, coming to. Go ahead, Dr. Lama. Adrian, the, you know what? That has been on my mind for a long time. And from a South African perspective, 
what I think has happened is unfortunate, the unfortunate um, urbanization. Um, we used to be collective as people. We would be talking to neighbors, um, community, support. Um, long ago, we could live on one income quite comfortably, but with urbanization, modernization, everyone moving to the city, everyone's working. Even grandmothers are working <laughs> as well. Um, I don't know who my neighbor is, um, you know, and women are expected to work as hard as men. And, and I, I think that, you know, we, we need to find a way to go back to basics, um, which is um, working a normal nine to five. People don't work nine to five. I can say in, in South Africa, people are working so hard, getting paid less. The pressures are so much. And those are people who are in employment. And, and yeah, we, we are broken. We, we've become too, we're all in our little silos and we need to maybe go back to community living, a, a, be a collective, similar to what um, Dr. Chandra was describing. Um, and I think that would be the first step because you learn these things from, the elders and they are support and, and we don't have that anymore, at least um, in South Africa. Such a, a good and pointed point. Go ahead, Dr. Chandra. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I completely agree with um, Adrian about, uh, you know, the prevention part of it. And it's so important to, so we have enough evidence um, to show us what are the risk factors. We know that uh, a woman with a previous history of trauma, of you know, a mental health problem has a higher risk. We know that sleep deprivation is a risk factor. We know that poor social support is a risk factor and domestic violence is a risk factor. So we know these risks and, and a sort of poor obstetric history is a risk factor. So I think the important thing is to kind of um, know how we can prevent these. So we, we know all of this, but I don't think that we are putting enough money into prevention. And so in addition to all the efforts at screening, I think we really need to focus a bit more on well-being, on how women can feel better, how they can cope better. Um, and I think that's where we need to put a lot of our money in. Uh, unfortunately, what happens is that we only look at people downstream okay. as psychiatrists. We only look at them when they have problems and, you know, put a lot of our energy in most conferences on pharmacotherapy and which antidepressant is safe and which is not safe. I'm not saying that's not important. I'm a psychiatrist. I know it's important. But I think an equal amount of work should go into preventive uh, mental health in, in the perinatal field. and you know, very actively involving partners and families uh, and explaining why this period is so vulnerable um, to all of this. And, and, and to just respond to Sylvia's issue about obstetric violence, I think it's a, a childbirth related trauma, which includes obstetric violence is something which has not been adequately addressed across the world. There is a group now which is working quite called Intersect, which is actually working across countries on this whole area. Because I think if a woman already has had a past trauma and she again faces childbirth-related trauma, it actually increases the chances of problems in, in the postpartum. Um, and sometimes we pay so much attention to depression that we forget anxiety-related disorders, we forget trauma-related disorders, which actually add to the burden of depression and a common comorbid condition. So I think, you know, one thing that I always tell my trainees is don't just keep focusing on depression. There's a lot out there which kind of looks like depression, but probably is not. You know, it's probably something else and it requires a different kind of intervention. So I think two things um, that one, prevention is important. We know the risk factor, so let's just put money into that. And the second is, look for comorbidities, particularly trauma-related comorbidities. Thank you for that, Dr. Chandra. And that really pivots us quite well for the next question. Um, and something that, that I wanna kick this off by saying, which is very aligned with what you just shared, you know, there's not just one thing we can do to solve this crisis. 
it's a continuum. And I look at it as pre-education, preconception, prevention, education throughout the perinatal period, screening, and treatment, right? Access to treatment. There are all of these things that really, you know, unfortunately we don't have the, the commitment or, um, you know, the, the willpower to tackle all of these, but all of these different areas play a role in overcoming this crisis and improving maternal mental health outcomes. So I'd love to hear from all of you um, to share a little bit about best practices in your country that kind of speak to one or more of these different interventions uh, in regards to maternal mental health. All right. Um, so as I said, in South Africa, um, a lot of effort has been put into on paper. Very brilliant. You know, we do have um, midwife obstetric units. We have the screening tools. Um, mothers have access to um, what you'd call prenatal, antenatal vitamins. We have a brilliant screening program for um, other medical conditions. There's six weeks follow up. Great on paper. The problem is um, the screening tool that I mentioned earlier, for example, is, is not being they're not doing it right um and it's not in the they haven't rolled out the maternal health records that have the screening tool so it's not being done and um the challenges that i experience is that um healthcare professionals are not so keen on and not comfortable on um, mental health questions and as i said where do they go to often if we find that someone has an issue a mother has a an issue, where does she go to? And the reality is there's almost no place for them to go. We don't have perinatal mental health as a, they're no like official experts in the field. We don't have any of those resources. Everything is still in its infancy. Mental health is as it is a crisis um, point. Um, recently, in the last few years, we had um, up to 44 um, patients with mental illness who were in a facility die as a result of a, a policy um, to shut down long-term um, psychiatric facilities. Um, and it, I mean, so yeah, so I, I, yeah, I think, I think what I'm trying to say is that, yeah, um, government does try, but what I'm trying to say is that like, um, yeah, the, a lot of work needs to be done. And I think um, advocacy um, and just breaking down the stigma um, is a first place to start. And, and women right now in South Africa are under attack uh, from all fronts. Uh, Gender-based violence rates are through the roof, um, unplanned pregnancies. I mean, I just quoted you the stats that up to two thirds of children only don't know who their fathers are in, in South Africa, you know. So we, it's, 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 it's like a because of a social, social trauma, social ill. We are on at the end and and trying to pick the pieces together. But um, yeah, I am hopeful that you know we just you know have platforms like this and slowly create awareness and learn from each other. Um, for, on how to implement in under-resourced um, so, sort of areas, how to how to um, help help mothers um, in in this situation that they face. And Dr. Lumo, um, you are doing so much of that work yourself in the clinic that you started, um, and I know that that what you've created attempts to provide the psychiatric and clinical care to new and expecting mothers. And I know that we also spoke a little bit about um, how imperative that education piece is. I always say in regards to building the motherhood center, right? You know, the assumption when we build programs out like this is you build it and they will come. But that is an assumption. And the assumption doesn't take into consideration that there is so much shame and stigma that surrounds internal mental health that women don't just come um, because there's so much fear 
around what family members will think, doctors will think, will I have my baby taken away? Uh, and so, you know, it, it's an, it again speaks to the continuum of how you can't just do one without the other. Being able to implement all of these pieces is really going to make a difference. But I, I also wanted to give you a chance to talk about the great work that you're doing in South Africa. Yeah, so look, I do run a pro bono maternal mental health clinic, and this was based on um, the hospital where I work, which is a mother and child hospital. It's classified as a tertiary hospital. So all the high risk mothers um, who are at high risk of um, perinatal mental conditions, um, they, they found a prevalence of about 30%. And at their antenatal clinic um, in a month, up to 2,000 mothers attend. So I was expecting quite a number of mothers. And what, what's been disappointing is that, you know, it's less than 1%. But there are a lot of challenges that people face accessing. We ha you know, we have a huge unemployment rate. Only 30% of the population is employed. So you like having transport to come and access the service. So I've tried to align the clinic on an antenatal clinic day so that while the mom's waiting in the queue to see the obstetrician, I step in. Unfortunately, I am a one man show. I mean, I should work with a team. There are a lot of social issues. Even the social worker is not really clued up with you know, what must happen sometimes. And also, um, unfortunately, health professionals themselves, I think as Sylvia raised, um, not really up, up to date, that it's okay to take an antidepressant during pregnancy. And we do know that if we don't have enough psychologists, um, you know, the next best thing is an antidepressant, you know, to, to keep a person going. So we still have doctors who, and, and nurses who, you know, are not so keen on, 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 on medication. So yeah, there's a lot. Um, there is a foundation, it's called Grow Great. And they have, um, it's an NGO and they have what they call the Flourish Foundation, whom I support as well. So they are people who are community in the community and they um, are tasked with training to um, support mothers. So they run like, um, antenatal and postnatal sort of groups in their communities. Um, and these are sort of lay people who, you know, throughout the country trained up. So um, Grow Great and Flourish, they're really doing a, a lot of work. So there are some small strides, um, but a huge mountain to climb. And I'm really grateful for these platforms um, so that we can exchange ideas and information on how we can overcome the challenges in perinatal mental health. Would you like me to go next? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, yeah, thanks, Lavinia. Such a you know important um, area about training. So just to talk about best practices, um, there are a few. Th so in terms of policy. Uh, we have a new Mental Health Care Act, which uh, came about in 2017, which kind of mandates that women who are admitted into hospitals, if they have a child below three years, the child and mother should not be separated, uh, which basically means that you need to have more mother baby units, mother toddler units. Um, unfortunately, it's still on paper uh, and we are still, you know, because most people don't, have not started mother baby units. So even though the act says that the mother and baby, mother and child should not be separated unless there is risk to the child uh, or risk to the mom, uh, it's not been uh, implemented. But it's a it's a great it's a great law. It's a great act. The fact that it actually got mentioned in the Mental Health Care Act um, itself, I think, is a huge thing. And I think it's just about rolling that out gradually. So that's one positive thing in terms of policy. In terms of other best practices, one of the things we started during the pandemic and which was initiated actually by the obstetricians, uh, they felt that they were not trained enough in mental health. And so we started with the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in India. We started a certificate course for obstetricians in perinatal mental health. And it has joined faculty from psychiatry, psychology, and 
from obstetrics as well, which is which has been very su su successful because it's not like we are talking, you know, it's only the mental health professionals who are talking. It's obstetricians who've gone through a course themselves and they are talking. So um, the obstetricians seem to be much more open to receiving this kind of an information. So that, that's, a, that's been a very popular course. And now um, we're talking with Lavinia also on how we can roll that out in South Africa. So sort of learning from each other, which I think, you know, that's what is very important. Um, that things that are being done in our, like how we use their screening tool uh, to in our country, you know, we are now trying to work with the obstetricians training program across countries. So that's, that's a big plus. We've also started a certificate course for psychiatrists in perinatal psychiatry. Um, which again is a very important issue because not a lot of uh, not a lot of psychiatrists feel comfortable in handling perinatal mental health. So um, it's it's not just physicians, but it's even psychiatrists who are apprehensive about working in perinatal mental health. So we started that course, and again, that's become very popular. Um, we are having the third course. We have a course every year. It's an online course. It runs for a sort of um, three months uh, every Friday for three hours. And it's a very uh, active, interactive case discussion. And we find that uh, both male and female psychiatrists are very involved in that. Um, we've also developed a directory of people who have any kind of training in perinatal mental health, even if it's a little bit, or even if they are doing perinatal mental health in their clinics. So it's a, India is a large country but we have about 220 psychiatrists in our directory. So that if there is a woman in a particular region, we can kind of refer them to that person. Uh, and we have a very strong listserv, uh, which we use for discussing cases and you know, issues like that. So that helps. So these are some of the best practices that we are following. And of course, um, there is our, our own perinatal psychiatry service, which is really popular. And, um, you know, what's interesting is so we run the outpatient service every Friday. It starts at nine, finishes at three. And every Friday we have 40 to 50 women attending that service just for perinatal mental health, you know, or referred by obstetricians, referred by other psychiatrists, walk-in um, women talking to each other and saying, go to that service. It's great. You know, so I think it's it's taken a long time, uh, and I really want to reassure Lavinia that it will it will pick up. Your clinic will pick up. It's a question of you know time and and people getting to know about it. Um, I'm not sure whether you want me to talk about the mother baby unit right now, but I can come back to it later. But I can think of the training and um, sort of capacity, you know, building as a huge uh, input into uh, advancing perinatal mental health. The other good thing that India has done is we have something called a district mental health program. So in our country, um, we have, you know, about 700 something districts. And we are aiming that every district, it's like a county, um, has a, a mental health team, which includes a psychiatrist, a psychiatric nurse, a psychologist, and a social worker. Uh, and we are training the district mental health unit in perinatal mental health so that they can be part of the stepped care approach. Um, so that's another huge development that has happened, uh, which, which is really helping. Um, I see there was a question on fragmentation of medical services and, and I hope this kind of answers that question about how we're trying to integrate everything because everybody's working in silos, funding goes in silos, so unless we merge those services, things are not going to get better. There's a, there was another question on um, somatization and how a lot of women, uh, particularly from some cultures, don't talk about anxiety and depression, uh, but talk about physical complaints. And that is so true. Um, and we are right now submitting a paper on that where we have looked systematically at somatic symptoms and found that it doesn't relate so much to anemia or poor nutrition, but it seems to be correlated directly with the severity of depression. Because in many cultures to talk about low mood 
a sadness, uh, like Sylvia mentioned, at a time when you're supposed to be happy, seems very counterintuitive to women, to, to family members. And so what they do is they talk about the physical symptoms. Because if they talk about physical symptoms, then at least uh, they would get some help. That's, so that's one part of it. The second is that many times in, when you're depressed, you actually have physical symptoms. You feel tired. Um, you, know, you have pains and aches. And so uh, the focus is then on physical symptoms. Many languages don't have the word for depression. Many Indian languages, you have the word for sadness, but you don't have a word for depression. And so how will a woman talk about her mood? Uh, and even if she talks about it in some way, you know, she'll be poo-pooed and say, no, no, you know, it's all in your head and, you know, do something else, pray or do something and you'll feel better. So I think for all these reasons, uh, somatic complaints are uh, very commonly expressed. And I think in countries like the US, uh, where there are people from different cultures, it's extremely important for both nurses, perinatal mental health physicians, um, you know, to kind of be very uh, attuned to the fact that women may not talk, not talk about depression or anxiety, but manifest with a lot of somatic complaints, which don't seem to be explained by their physical health problems. Uh, and so to look for depression, like, like behind this, you know, there's a story which is hidden and you need to look beyond those, those words and those complaints. So, yeah. Thank you for that, Dr. Shatter. You covered so much and I know India is doing so much and I know that you're touching all of that. Um, curious, we, we have a, a few moments left. Want to hear from Sylvia and Adrian as well about best practices in your own country. Um, well, in, in my country, in Costa Rica, but I think Ecuador too, we're a bit behind actually. Um, uh, in Costa Rica, there have been some advances in like general um, matters, for example, uh, respect to childbirth or um, against obstetric violence, in, like laws being adopted in these senses or therapeutic abortion, for example that are elements related but not directly regarding maternal mental health right so um i'm afraid that in that sense our our best practices are limited to um the psychol the general psychologists in the public uh, health system which are um like they have an overload of work right and limited resources and uh, we do use the Edinburgh scale, um, like in, in the country, professionals, we, we know about it and people use it when they want to rule it out. But there are no specific trainings on perinatal mental health in the country. And uh, so the few of us who have taken some, it's um, online programs or um, specific uh, programs from different institutes and universities but um, it's very limited. So I think hearing from you, I think we have like uh, the whole road ahead of us <laughs> uh, from everything that we need to work on, right? And in Ecuador, interestingly enough, um, the mental health law does include maternal mental health too, um, but they have no specialization either. And uh, they like the responsibility goes to the uh, community health um, uh, centers. So it's like uh, you have the doctor and a psychologist, and that psychologist has to take care of everything from a child with a developmental disorder and an elder person with any other issue, and mothers too, right? So it's like not not very specialized, which may lead to all these. Um, issues that you have all mentioned. So I think we have much to, to learn and much to do, right? <laughs> Sylvia, I don't want to lose sight of um, the, the great work that you're doing based on the groups that you've started and really a peer support model, right? Which has proven to be incredibly effective. Um, and if you want to just take a couple of minutes to talk about that, I mean, that's, that's, that's important work. Uh, yes, uh, actually, well, that goes hand in hand with PSI, right, Postpartum Support International, uh, which uh, 
helps train us and provides the example for us because they do this all over the world. And um, it's basically online support groups, peer support groups. Uh, sometimes they have like special support groups, like for just postpartum depression, just PTSD, just psychosis. In, in our case, we haven't been able to do it so, so specialized. We have just general new mom support groups. And um, in Costa Rica, it happens once a month online. In Ecuador, we have once a month online and once a month uh, in person in Guayaquil, which is the city I'm located in. And um, they have proven very uh, effective, actually. Uh, I have seen, and women uh, speak out and say how much they have actually um, felt better, right? Because um, it's not the same, and it will not under any circumstance um substitute therapy or psychiatric treatment but in mild cases of anxiety mild cases of uh, depression or just the beginning of it it can give you another way to go right you don't feel alone you hear other stories of people who went through this and you understand that well this is not like something wrong with me like in my essence it's just something i'm going through and it will pass and I will be better. I'm not like the worst mom in the world. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just, I have an, an issue here and I need to speak about it to work through it. So I think that has been very interesting to see. And in Costa Rica, we have a group, some people just regularly go in and they still go in and go in. Um, not just like in the first few months postpartum, but throughout the first years of life. And they, I think one of the benefits you get is also helping other people uh, go through the process that you already went through, right? Um, I think that helps mothers heal their own process. And um, an interesting element, I think that I, I, I talked to you, Paige, about it was um, the differences from the Ecuadorian group and the Costa Rican group. <laughs> In Costa Rica, um, when I started all this, I didn't say this is for this country or that country. I had just moved to Ecuador. I was just uh, coming out of my postpartum depression and I felt I had to do something about it. I went back to school. I, you know, I was like um, reorganizing my life. <laughs> and so my social networks were mainly from Costa Rica. And when I started announcing that I was going to organize these groups. Most people that came from were from Costa Rica. And it was very easy to get the conversation started, right? Uh, people openly spoke about the issues of being a mother, uh, uh, of what stressed them or, or what made them sad or their um, birth stories, which were very hard. And when we started working this in Ecuador, that I actually allied with other health, uh, mental health professionals to start the group here through their networks because I evidently didn't know anyone. So uh, we, we started announcing and started gathering uh, mothers. Uh, they, they weren't so up, up, upcoming about the contradictions. They had to wait um, to listen a story. I had to tell more of my own story, for example. Uh, of my own difficulties to encourage them to speak about their own difficulties and uh, uh so after a while now they 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 got the hang of it so they log in and they say oh and they tell their whole issues um and when new people come uh, when they hear these other people who have already come here and they openly speak they speak openly too but it was interesting that it took like a while, like educating these um, mothers uh, to this dynamic. Whereas in yeah. Costa Rica, not at all. <laughs> People logged in and they they just went on about the issues. So community, I think it's just community is such a powerful tool. Very powerful. Very and powerful. I, I wanna I see you there, Adrian, and I know we have just a few minutes left. So bring us home. 
um, in regards to American best practices. And then again, I could go on and do this for another three hours, but I realized um, people have places to be and Dr. Chandra has to go to bed. So Adrian. Yeah. Yeah, so Sylvie, I'm so glad to hear about the support groups. I ran support groups as a volunteer with PSI for many, many years. And see, it's it's um, all the treatment doesn't have to be therapy and psychiatry, right? Support groups are huge. The peer support model um, is amazing. There's um, so let me just talk. You know, some of the best practices in the United States, like doing something like centering pregnancy, which is group prenatal care, so that a group of moms, eight to ten moms have their prenatal care together. They see the nurse for an entire hour. There's a lot of education that goes on that there's you know, a lot of support that's already being built. Um, things like creating a postpartum plan. Here in the United States, everybody is very focused on the birth plan and on having the gender reveal and sort of all of this around the labor and delivery and actual childbirth. Let's plan for what comes after that, right? If we can help parents make that transition to parenthood. Home visiting programs, there's been a lot in the chat about nurse family partnership. Um, you know, getting uh, uh, community health workers and doulas and promotores um, involved in people's lives, being in their home to help them assess what's going on and give them tips, tools, and techniques. Again, this whole idea of prevent some of these things by giving parents more to help them with this transition to Parenthood. And then, you know, some very high cost programs like the psychiatry access program, where basically um, the very well-trained psychiatrists go out and train obstetric and pediatric providers and other psychiatrists to screen and treat sort of the general anxiety and depression. And then they save this, the, the very expensive and scarce psychiatry resources for the most difficult cases, right? So that makes a lot of sense. Um, apps, I saw somebody dropped in the chat something about the mommy app. Uh, so there's, you know, again, low hanging fruit that is not expensive that we can use. So um, again, there's just so, so many resources we just need to figure out, right, how to collect all of them and how to help deliver them to new parents. Um, and certainly, like I think I just keep now, I have written down in my notebook in really big letters now is prevention, right? Prevention, that's what we need to do. So anyway, thanks. Thank you all. Thank you, Paige, for organizing this. And again, we could talk forever. Absolutely. I, I just cannot thank our presenters enough for um, being willing to join us at hours across the globe um, and taking the time to share with us their expertise, the work they've done, the progress they've made in their countries and the work that still needs to get done. Um, thank you all so very much. Uh, we've learned so much here. I think the more we have conversations about this, the more we learn from each other. Like you, Adrian, I've just written down 10 pages of things that, oh, we could do that here in the US. Um, so I look forward to many more conversations just like this one. Um, and hopefully one day we'll see some of you, all of you at the Marseille conference. I wanna thank our audience so much for being a part of this today. I really hope you all walk away with something that perhaps shines a light on a best practice or something else important that has to do with maternal mental health. I uh, want to remind everybody that we did record this. For those of you that registered, you will get an email with a link. Um, and if it's okay with my presenters, um, I will also add any kind of information or resources that they would like to make sure are in there. Uh, and hopefully we'll have this uh, recording up on our website as well. Um, so again, thank you all. Um, just to remind you, the Motherhood Center is here for you, those of you that are located in New York and New Jersey. Um, and if you're not, we can certainly help connect you to a resource that is in your community and you have these wonderful women to help you find one in your country. Um, so thank you all. Um, and this will not be the last time that, that we come together and talk about our great work. Have a wonderful morning, afternoon and evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank Thanks you very so. much. Thank you.